Did Rise of Kingdoms just release a brand new commander that is better than Joan of Arc? In this video, we're going to talk about whether or not William is going to replace Joan of Arc on the battlefield, especially for free-to-play players, and I think the answer is probably going to be heck yeah. Hello my friends and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the newest commander that's making its way into the game, William the First, who looks absolutely phenomenal for free-to-play players to go pick up as a long-term project. If you like Rise of Kingdoms guides that help you get value and smash your enemies, consider smashing that subscribe button for daily Rise of Kingdoms videos. We're a sponsored content creator and I'm pretty sure that I said they might never release a legendary version of Joan of Arc because it would just be too good. And um, here he is. <laughs> here he is, ready for action. In this video, we're going to talk about a couple things. First of all, why is it that William is, in my opinion, a Joan of Arc replacement for spenders and possibly also a Joan of Arc pairing or replacement for free-to-play players as well? And I think it will be a solid replacement. We're going to review the pairs that I think are going to be really exceptional with this commander so that you can get some really crazy value, and then we'll hypothesize what's going to happen as this commander changes the meta in Rise of Kingdoms. So let's start with why we're even talking about William I in the first place. And no, it's not because he's new. I mean, that's part of it, but it's because he does a lot of things to buff your march and debuff enemy marches. And that is very, very powerful for a free-to-play player because you don't care about having the best technology to get the full effect from some of these abilities. Now, I've already highlighted the first skill because there's a march speed at reduction. And importantly, this removes extra skill damage buffs. They cannot take effect for three seconds after being hit by the active skill of William I, which is area of effect. So there is an area of effectability that is slowing. That's great utility. That is making it so extra damage effects don't apply. That is great utility. I think that means commanders that are very popular, like Esong, Sun Tzu, even just talents from the skill tree might be nullified, which is very powerful. We're still working to understand exactly how this works. And of course, once it's in the game, we can go and test it more fully. Um, these commanders aren't actually here yet. And, you know, we'll also talk a little bit about when this commander will come to your kingdom. Um, the next skill we need to go and get a look at is the fact that this is going to be really good when the target is getting surrounded and you want to be in situations as a free-to-play player. When you are surrounding the target, you're going to get some extra damage. The second skill actually gives you some march speed, which is really crucial, especially for free-to-play players that need to evade combat. This is also a cavalry commander, also very exceptional for a free-to-play player because cavalry move faster than all other troop types and charge talents give you a 30% march speed boost when you get below 50%. So if you need to get out of a bad situation, yeah, this is a great commander to be using and cavalry are a phenomenal choice. Now, you may not be thinking, well, Chiskul, like you've really said all the things that would make me think this replaces Joan of Arc. No, there is one more thing. And it is the fourth skill, which is kind of insane. That skill, Scourge of the North. When hidden a bloodline hits a target, this commander's troops gain 10% increased defense. So that's not too crazy. It might bump up to 20%, it looks like here. Um, but in addition, when hidden bloodline hits two or more targets, all this commander's troops and nearby allied troops gain 10% increased defense and 50 rage per second for three seconds. Now note, I don't know if this defense boost works for both your own march, if you hit one target, and also when you're getting uh, multiple marches, if it becomes a 20% boost there. But no matter how you slice it, 10% defense is really solid, doesn't care about the troop type, and you get 50 rage per second for three seconds. Now look, I get that this buff is not as good as Joan of Arc's buff. Her buff is better. But, first of all, does this stack with Joan of Arc's buff? I don't know yet. Gotta test, gotta find out. The other thing I'm gonna call attention to is the fact that Joan of Arc doesn't really do anything besides give her buff and, like, have a little heal, right? Like, she's got this buff. It's very good. She's a one-trick pony. This is all she does. She does the tiniest amount of healing on the face of the earth. 10% chance from normal attacks to trigger a 450 healing factor. Woo! That's like half as good as other epics like Pelagius, you know, not very exciting. And there's no internal cooldown listed over here. Well, guess what? Over here on Joan of Arc, there's even an internal cooldown on your freaking heal. Boo. 
increases your normal attack damage by 25%, whatever. So you've basically got a stat stick over here. All she does is her one thing. She just buffs everybody. And that's so good that we're still using her. But if you're battling at the Ancient Ruins or Altars of Darkness and you can hit multiple targets, which I suspect you can, because typically the area of effect for a legendary commander is larger, then yeah, you're going to get a lot of value. And speaking of his area of effect, rectangle area. I mean, that might just be a typo. Or this might be the freaking most amazing thing that's ever happened to Rise of Kingdoms, or it might not be very usable. We're going to have to see when they come into the game, but I have a very strong suspicion that it's going to be freaking outstanding. It could be as big as the fan shape, except, you know, a rectangle, right? So you're covering much more area if that's the case. We'll see how that actually works. The point is that I think for all of those reasons, this commander is likely to be better than a Joan of Arc to bring to the battlefield. The question becomes, who do you pair this commander with, right? If you're bought into this idea that you've got a Joan of Arc-like effect on a commander that isn't actually just kind of otherwise not doing very much for you, and I get Joan of Arc has the support tree, I don't actually particularly like the talents available on William. I know he's like raising his arm in excitement about the fact that I tapped him, but like, you know, cavalry and attack are not all that amazing as a combination, and sure, they're good on Attila Takeda, okay, but... There are a few talents in the attack tree that are really great for commanders that are doing normal attack damage. He's not really about that normal attack damage life. He's all about that skill damage, both in the first skill and in the third skill. I blanked for a second. It is the third skill where that is the case. What are the pairs that are going to be really great? Let's start with the epics. I think if you are free to play, you have migrated to an older kingdom. There's a number of reasons why you might do that or why you might not do that. But let's say you've done that. The Belisarius, I think, is going to be the best pick as the primary commander. He doesn't have the rage engine that I would be looking for, but he's got mobility, which is going to let you evade combat situations that you don't want to be in. It's also going to let you pick up Hasty Departure to move around the battlefield for a very big burst of speed and get into the situations that you want, particularly valuable if you are battling at the Altar of Darkness or Ancient Ruins or in a KVK context near player cities that belong to your own alliance. You can move in and and around those cities very, very easily to do tactical strikes to apply debuffs. Now, I like Belisarius because he reduces the attack and also the defense of the target by 30%, which is a big deal. He's less concerned about doing lots of damage, and he is giving you a lot of defense. Also, if you do manage to get out of combat, you're going to get a 50% march speed boost for 10 seconds, which is really quite valuable. Now, other commanders that I'm avoiding at the epic tier are Pelagius because... I don't think he's got the mobility and he doesn't have the right mobility trees to make that happen. Even though he has the sustain, he's really more of a raw damage sort of a commander. I like the rage gen. I like a lot about what he's doing. I just worry that you're going to get caught out of position and completely shredded if you use a Pelagius. Also true of by bars. If you think you can manage your position on the field and avoid getting caught out of position, which spoiler alert, even I get caught out of position regularly and I spend a lot of time with practicing and fighting in the field. I think that most players will get caught out. The question is how much and what can you do about it? And Pelagius and Bybars can't do a ton. Now, you could, of course, also pair with the Joan of Arc, but we don't yet know if these abilities will stack. If they do stack, pff, Joan of Arc primary is the jam for sure. It's going to make you a big target on the battlefield, especially because her new ability, like, she waves her flag around as the animation, which, like... It's like, come hit me, baby, but you know, whatever. It's what it is now. That's what her animation looks like. So you could pair with Joan of Arc, but I want to talk about some solid legendary pairs that I would think free-to-play players or even spenders would have great access to. Those legendary commanders would include Cao Cao. Uh, it's basically an upgraded version of a Belisarius. It's got the sustain you really want. It's got rage restoration, which you really want. It's all around better than a belly, and I would say 5, 1, and some number of skills over here, and you're just better with the double C than you are with the Belisarius. So uh, a lot of players that make it to this point in the game when the commander is available, they've probably got a double C and a great spot to use them as the pairing. Similarly, if you did spend even just to max the first two skills on Minamoto, I think that would be a fine pick. I, would be, I think it would be a totally fine pick. Minamoto should be the primary. I think the skill tree is better than the attack tree in this instance. You also can get some 
March speed from the peacekeeping tree, which I think is very nice. And also the warlord debuff is very, very effective for swarming down targets. So if you're being really smart about who you're hitting, I think this debuff being applied strategically can be very, very valuable. The last commander I want to talk about that I think most folks are unlikely to have, but I would be remiss to not mention is going to be Takeda. A Takeda primary for the mobility talents would be pretty freaking maneuverable on the battlefield. And you're not going to have a lot of rage gen, but I think that's a better pick than the attack tree if you're a free-to-play player. If you're a spender, I might try to actually reverse those, use the Takeda as the secondary commander, um, and worry less about getting caught out of position. This commander is extremely tanky. He's got healing. He's doing a lot of things that the William really wanted to get some value from. He's missing the rage gen, but the tankiness and healing sustain is there, and William doesn't really have a way to do that otherwise. Now, what I want to talk about is the perfect pairs. And if you've got an older account, which a lot of players will that get to the point that they're seeing William in the game, there's a couple commanders that I think would be really quite exceptional. One is going to be Khan. Khan primary with a William secondary is going to machine gun out those active skills. That is because there's a massive amount of rage reduction. That means you have more opportunities to hit multiple targets, which means you have more opportunities to buff all your allies. And that seems like a really good thing to me. The other commander that I think is really quite exceptional is going to be Saladin. And Saladin has more utility. So this is a better pick probably for free to play uh, or very low spenders um, who have not hit their T5. Because look, Saladin is going to reduce healing effectiveness. A lot of people still bring Richard I to the Ancient Ruins and Altar of Darkness. And the support tree is going to machine gun out those uh, active skills, which is exactly what you want for William in order to have more opportunities for that fourth skill to trigger to generate more rage, which means more opportunities to get that skill to hit multiple targets. Very powerful. Also very tanky as a commander. Uh, I like the Saladin choice, the support tree. Very tanky. A build like this for the open field, I think would do wonders. You might want to go more in on some of this rage gen and some of the tankiness over here, but you've really got a lot of choices depending on whether or not you think you're going to be focused down. If you think you're focused down, you need to be more in loose formation and emergency protection. If you think you're going to be able to snipe from the outside, I really do like a talent like Buckler Shield, since counterattack damage is the damage an enemy deals to you when you're hitting them. So reducing counterattack damage, very, very strong in situations where you can hit targets that are not hitting you back. All in all, I think William is a crazy fun addition into Rise of Kingdoms. I'm a little terrified that he's kind of the legendary tier of Joan of Arc, but I'm also somewhat thankful that this is not just a better version of Joan of Arc. It's a different version of Joan of Arc. Yes, this effect is similar, and we don't know if it's going to stack. However, I do think that it's not just one ability that's clearly this insane buff and all the other abilities are Garbo on this commander. He's a fully fledged commander that's very, very powerful in his own right. And he happens to have so much utility that I think free to play players should really think about how they're going to plan for William coming into the game. And speaking of which, let me put onto the screen a diagram provided by Stormy Reigns. Really appreciate that he's put together these infographics and allowed us to share them. It's going to show the progression of commanders into Rise of Kingdoms. You may be wondering, when should I start thinking about saving for William? William is going to be available much later into the game. We don't even know exactly when he's going to hit at the time that I'm recording this. We do see that it's going to come from the Wheel of Fortune. And the Wheel of Fortune means that free-to-play players will have access almost immediately. Um, yeah, you got to farm up some gems, but card up in the top if you want to know exactly how to farm up over a thousand gems a day, really. So assuming you're going to unlock William and you're going to want to save up some amount of those sweet, sweet Universal Legendary Commander Sculptures to work on him, I would make the argument that probably, depending on your rate of Sculpture gain, your progression will be to work on Esong first Alexander the Great or Constantine next. You could double back a little bit for Richard I if you wanted to, or at any point in time, you could take him to like 5511 and you can get a lot of value. Even a 5111 Richard is really quite exceptional. And from there, now it's the time to start thinking about saving up for William, depending on how gun ho you are about expertising him the moment that he comes into the game. Because unlike a spender, who's going to try to spin the wheel the max number of times and get every sculpture they can, um, you could, you could 
work toward expertising this commander the second that you get them from the first wheel and save your gems for other stuff. And that is a fine choice. You lose out on some 50% off spins, some free spins. Um, but if you weren't going to always spin every wheel for this commander, then hey, that seems like a fine choice. Now, in terms of the level that this skill needs to be, I got good news for you. Yeah, going from 10% defense to 20% defense, assuming that it is going to 20% defense is nice, but I'm really much more interested in the rage, 50 rage per second for three seconds is actually the meat of this ability. So I actually think that, you know, you go in, you max the first skill, you probably want to max the second skill as well because there's non-linear progression on these skills. What do I mean by that? It jumps up by 2% cavalry attack from level 1 to level 2. But from level 4 to level 5, you're getting a 4% boost, which is really quite nice. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's mostly linear on this one. You wouldn't have to focus on that one. Honestly, all the skills are so good. And most they're mostly linear. They're mostly linear in their progression. You really, like, you max the first skill, and then from there... Like, you really could just go 1 1 1 and start leveling him if you wanted to. I'm going to think more on that to see if there's really somewhere I feel like they need to land on. I think, in general, if you're trying to get that march speed, and I think a lot of people should be, maybe you want to do max that second skill, but uh, you got a lot of options here. And there's not, to me, a clear, very, very like one sided direction for how you skill this commander up, which is great news. Because this ability, even at skill level one, is going to do the things that Joan of Arc is doing that are so important. She's generating rage, and she's giving buffs. And yeah, the buff's not as good. And yeah, we don't know if it's going to stack, but I think it is going to be quite exceptional, assuming you can get in those situations where you are going to hit multiple targets. Does this mean that Joan of Arc will be fully retired? I don't think so. In situations where you aren't going to hit multiple targets, and those do exist then your good old-fashioned Joan of Arc is going to be the way to go. And if you're buffing something like a rally, chances are, chances are, Joan of Arc is still the tool you're going to need in the toolbox to deliver those sweet, sweet buffs. If you're looking for more videos to help you get value with free-to-play commander pairings, I'll put a card up in the top for a video that I think you're really going to enjoy getting some of those really solid free-to-play commander pairs. And consider throwing a comment on the video with what you think the best use will be for William. Am I off base in indicating that I think he's going to be really phenomenal for low spenders and free-to-play players? Or do you think that's kind of on target? Throw a like on the video if you at all found this entertaining or helpful. That's your way of giving me a virtual high five. And until next time, you have fun smashing the kingdom.